How do you LMs add numbers like in these equations? Let's say we ask the chatbot the answer of 26 plus 55 equals, and it quickly replies 81. But here's where it gets interesting, because these models were never explicitly programmed to do math, which means they don't know numbers the way a calculator does. In fact, even when they give the right answer, everything they know comes purely from reading lots of text. So how did it actually figure it out? Well, some of you may say, no one knows. And that's fair because the neural network really is a black box. But settling for the answer no one knows feels pretty unsatisfying. So in this video, we're going to demystify a bit of that black box by exploring concepts like sparse features that help us better understand how the model works, intuitive takeaways for the self-attention mechanism, and some limitations of what we have learned so far. So make sure you stay until the end. First of all, large language models don't see numbers. Instead, they see tokens. So before the model can even tackle a calculation, the input is broken into tokens like these, and each one is turned into an integer ID. These IDs are then mapped to a high-dimensional vector, let's say 768 dimensions for smaller models, these vectors live in the very same high-dimensional space as every other word or symbol. So far, each vector only carries the local meaning of its token. 26 and 55 are numbers, while the plus sign and the equal sign are operators. But local information isn't enough because the meaning of each token depends on the context as well. And that's where the self-attention mechanism steps in to help make sense of the entire input. Positional encodings are first added to the original embeddings, so the model knows where each token sits. Then the embeddings are passed through three learned projection matrices to create a query vector a key vector, and a value vector for every token. Let's first focus on the dot product of Q and K transpose, because that's how we get the attention scores. Each query vector compares every key vector by a dot product to produce attention scores. Higher scores mean higher relevance, so the model pays more attention to those token pairs. For example, when processing the equal token, its query vector compares with the keys for all four tokens. However, raw dot product values grow with the dimension of the key and query vectors. So we divide them by the square root of dk to keep the values in a stable range before softmax. Softmax then turns the tension scores into non-negative weights that sum to 1 for each query. The row corresponding to the equal sign query of attention scores we're focusing on here tells us how much each value vector will contribute to the updated meaning of the equal sign token. For example, the updated attention weights that you're seeing here for the equal sign token determine how strongly each value vector contributes to its updated representation. The main takeaway is this query key value mixing repeats in every self-attention layer, so each token gradually refines its context. As a result, the embedding of the equal sign token shifts from a generic equal sign to one that encodes conclusion of 26 plus 55, while 26 becomes the first operand in addition. In contrast, for a different prompt such as 150 minus 100 equals, the same equal sign would instead lean towards subtraction semantics because attention would focus more on the minus sign. After attention finishes contextualizing the embeddings, they flow into the feed for a network, technically the multi-layer perceptron, which further transform the contextually informed embeddings to contribute toward the final prediction of 81. However, most neurons in the transformer's MLP are polysemantic which means a single unit might activate for unrelated inputs like numbers, cities, or animals. So it is hard to say exactly why any neuron fires. In an anthropic study on the biology of a large language model, the researchers froze the attention blocks but trained a separate cross-layer transcoder to replicate each MLP's output, while adding a sparsity penalty that pushes the network to leave almost all features off, so only a few features activate at a time. This results in a set of sparse features, which are learned patterns that 
light up only when the input matches a specific property. Let's get back to our addition task. After attention has mixed the context for each token, the first layer may activate features that detect the approximate scale of the numbers like 20-ish and 50-ish, along with more precise patterns such as ending digits like 5 and 6. In the second layer, since the model begins to refine the computation, one feature may detect that 6 plus 5 results in 11 and trigger a carry to the next digit. Another feature may detect that 2 plus 5 plus the carried one equals 8, and the other one detecting that the answer may be around 70. Finally, when the equal sign arrives in the last layer, the model activates three high-level constraints. One signals that the final answer should be approximately 80. Another makes sure the answer ends in 1, and the last one confirms the result is exactly 81. But how are these sparse features activated? A feature should fire only when its specific pattern is present, which means most values in the activation vector should stay at 0. In the cross-layer transcoder, two main drivers keep this vector sparse, which are L1 regularization and ReLU. An L1 penalty is added onto CLT feature activations during training, which discourages anything but the strongest signals. There are of course more details about the L1 term, but that's for another video. On the other hand, ReLU zeroes out negative activations on every forward pass during both training and inference. Filtering out weak or noisy signals. Now we've pretty much gone through the sophisticated journey for LLMs to add two numbers. But do these models really tell us what has been going on exactly? In fact, if you ask these chatbots how they arrived at the correct answer, it would probably regurgitate something like a math walkthrough. And this is because they have learned to mimic how humans explain math in this training data, even though the explanation has nothing to do with internal pathways that actually produce the answer. However, the research does mention that the replacement model only captures a small slice of of what the original model is really doing. And there's still a big gap between the simplified version and the full complexity of a real network, not to mention larger calculations where the model may struggle to generalize reliably due to the lack of data during training. So what is the solution? Chatbots are increasingly leaning on tool calling, such as external calculators, code, or APIs to provide verifiable answers, which are likely here to stay. 